All right. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from for today's 2020 Global Youth Economic Opportunities Summit live track event, Building a Foundation. We are so pleased to have you with us for our fifth in a series of virtual summit events between now and October 29th. We are nearly eight months into the coronavirus pandemic, an event that has demonstrated the fragility of our social and economic systems, especially for the most vulnerable, including billions of young people around the world. Yet the crisis has also demonstrated the resilience, creativity, and leadership of young people, as well as organizations like you who are working to support them right now. All of us development practitioners, funders, policymakers, and young people are trying to make sense of this changing landscape, adapt to the immediate challenges, and predict the road ahead. Um, before we dive in, I'm just gonna walk us through a little bit of this morning's agenda. We're very lucky to be joined by two terrific speakers, and we also have four concurrent breakout sessions following this morning's opening event hosted by our partners. And I wanna thank all of our organizing uh, partners for today's breakouts for joining us, for hosting and sharing the learning outcomes of your work in the field. So we'll have this morning's opening. We will hear two back-to-back -back lightning talks from our speakers, Shalon and Cassie. And then we're gonna reconvene with myself and our two speakers for a live discussion. During the videos and the discussion, we invite all of you to submit your questions into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, this is a great opportunity to engage in real time with our presenters today, ask them questions, um, and share some of your ideas about how they can uh, think about their programs within the larger context of our community. So diving in, in a typical year, the GYEO Summit convenes over four days in the fall in DC and brings together nearly 500 youth experts and innovators from around 75 countries. Obviously, this year required a different approach. Um, we started in the midst of the crisis to convene experts and youth voices to better understand the current situation. And we're using this year's summit events to elevate stories of partners who are collaborating in innovative ways to help gather and share critical information, tool, and ideas under the summit theme, reimagining youth economic opportunities in a post-pandemic world. And at the heart of this agenda are two key questions. What are the immediate impacts of COVID-19 on young people and how have our organizations responded? And how can what we're learning now inform what we do next to build more resilient, inclusive systems for youth economic opportunity in a post-pandemic world, or at least one where we are better prepared for future shocks? I wanna especially thank our summit sponsors for supporting this year's GYEO Summit as we've adapted to this online world um, and to help us explore these important online conversations. If you'd like to learn more about the summit, how to partner with us now or in the future, you can contact me at sarahs at makingsense.com. One of four annual summit technical tracks, the Building a Foundation track that we're exploring today is focused on the unique combination of skills that young people need to be resilient and achieve long-term social and economic success in a changing world of work. This, tap typically, this track typically explores um, effective models and approaches for supporting social and emotional learning in young people. For example, online learning, hybrid online learning, face-to-face, -face, integrated into formal education, standalone non-formal education, PYD or work-based learning. It's a huge track, there's a lot to explore. Um, so today's session, we're going to look specifically at how some of these approaches are being rethought, accelerated, adapted, or applied in response to the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on young people. Um, we're also gonna hear about a new approach that's being rolled out by our partners at RISE and Schmidt Futures and Hello World. And so we're very lucky to be joined by two terrific speakers in our opening session today. Cassie Crockett is Director and Head of Strategy at Schmidt Futures. In this role, Cassie leads strategy development with a particular focus on the RISE program, oversees the development of new programs for approval and coordinates efforts with partner organizations. Prior to Schmidt Futures, Cassie worked for McKinsey Company, a global consulting firm where she specialized in education technology and served as Chief of Staff of the Social Sector Office. During her time at McKinsey, Cassie managed relationships with and projects for clients while also working with firm leadership to refine McKinsey's long-term strategy for social impact. Cassie was also a core member of the global efficacy team at Pearson, the world's largest learning company. That team helped design and implement a business-wide transformation with the goal of improving learner outcomes around the globe. Shalon Bridges is the CEO and co-founder of Hello World, a nonprofit chaired by Sal Khan. She's working with leading educators, engineers, and data scientists to develop effective new ways to surface strengths in youth beyond GPAs and standardized tests. 
Previously, Shalon was COO in charge of strategy at DIY.org, a global online learning community that helps any kid anywhere learn any skill. As executive editor at Pearson, the world's largest learning company, she specialized in improving science education for over a decade. She builds companies, products, and teams that demonstrate, uh, that demonstrably discover and develop the potential in the next generation. So respectively, our speakers bring together unique insights from their work to create new pathways for learning and opportunity for young people. We'll hear some brief remarks now from Cassie and Shalon by video, and then we'll turn to a live discussion with our speakers. And again, I invite all of you to submit your questions in the chat box um, and engage in the conversation in real time. So thank you again to our speakers. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to Sarah Cole and the whole team for making this event happen and being so thoughtful about how to ensure a, a seamless conference for all of us and conversation. Uh, so my name is Cassie Crockett. I'm a director and the head of strategy at Schmidt Futures, which is a philanthropic initiative that was founded by Eric and Wendy Schmidt. At Schmidt Futures, our mission is to find exceptional people and help them do more for other people. So what does that actually look like in practice? One example is uh, our associate product manager program, where we find brilliant young computer scientists at this moment in their lives when they're facing an inflection point, specifically when they're graduating from college. And we give them a first professional experience that's grounded in doing social good and serving other people instead of sending them straight into the private sector. So I'm here today to talk about the earliest exploration of that approach to talent and that approach to philanthropy, which is a program that we're in the process of launching called RISE, a partnership with the Rhodes Trust. So last November, Eric and Wendy made a billion dollar commitment to advancing talent through their philanthropic work. Uh, this was a natural extension of work that they'd been doing for many years. They're both very philosophically grounded in the idea of putting people at the center of all that we do. As the anchor program of that commitment, they also announced that we would be launching RISE. Uh, I'll share a little bit about the approach overall on that program uh, through this talk. And then Shalon, who's been a key partner for us since the very early days, will dig deeper into the approach we've used to identify and select for talent. So what is RISE? RISE aims to identify brilliant 15 to 17 year olds around the world and then support them over the course of their lives as they work to serve other people. So the aim is both about serving those young people themselves and specifically targeting their superpowers towards social good, but also about building a constellation of other partners, institutions, resources that young people can tap into as they work to solve big global challenges. Those are lofty goals, so let's go into the details of what the program's actually going to look like. Uh, so first off, why do we care about 15 to 17 year olds? Uh, as described with the Associate Product Manager Program, we're really excited about finding people at an inflection point in their lives. At 15 to 17, for a lot of young people, you're capturing this moment of them considering what their trajectory into adulthood is going to look like. Are they going to go to university? Are they going to do something different? Where are they going to go? What will the next stage really look like? And we wanted to harness the energy in that particular moment as we were constructing this program. So who are we looking for uh, in this vast age range of 15 to 17. We're looking for people who demonstrate, yes, brilliance, but also empathy, integrity, perseverance, passion. And very critically, we're looking for young people who need a boost of some sort to get where they dream of going. I think in most cases that boost will be financial, but you could imagine scenarios where non-financial boosts could also be relevant. So what's RISE going to do for these brilliant, empathetic, perseverant, talented 15 to 17 year olds that we find. So every year there will be a hundred global winners. These folks will come from around the world and they will get uh, access to a lifetime of support that they will be able to tap into as they serve other people. That could include resources like scholarship funding and a laptop, include opportunities like career service uh, coaching and mentorship, but also include membership in this community of RISE winners when COVID allows, we want to bring that community together for travel and international experiences. And our hope is that we'll be able to build something very, very sticky for these young people from day one. Really critically, though, RISE is not about the hundred winners. Uh, those folks we will be working with very deeply, but it was important to us as we designed the program and a, a core principle uh, to make sure that everyone leaves the process better off than they were when they came into it. 
That could mean getting access to online resources that they wouldn't have the ability to tap into otherwise. It could mean a documented project that they'll be able to use for other applications, links to opportunities that are a good fit for them, and so on. Shalon's been leading the work on this from day one, uh, and so I'll let her drill a little bit farther into how this will actually work. So where are we now with RISE? We, uh, we launch applications for our first ever cohort of RISE winners this month. And so we're working to get the word out around the world and ensure that young people know about this opportunity and have the ability to access it. Um, though the mobile platform that Shalon's been building will be the primary entrance point into the program, we've separately been working on a paper-based application pathway and also a WhatsApp bot that will allow kids that lack the smart or semi-smartphones uh, required for a lot of mobile applications to actually sort of break into this program. Uh, the most important thing for me to say though is we recognize that our learning is just beginning on this. This is the beginning of a cycle of continuous improvement that is going to continue for, we hope, many, many years uh, and which we hope will sort of help us improve our programmatic design, our programmatic offerings, our selection processes over time. Right now, we, uh, to some extent, don't know what we don't know, and we're just excited to go public so that we can start uh, learning and start improving. Um, so wanted to just touch on a couple of interesting issues that we've encountered as a result of doing this in 2020. Uh, the switch to remote that I think probably threw everyone listening to this off balance in some way, certainly, uh, had effects on our team. There were both practical effects of it's a lot harder to build partnerships when you can't travel to meet with people. It's a lot harder to observe situations on the ground. Uh, it made the question of access a different one than we thought we'd be asking because we couldn't reliably count on kids being in school. But the switch to remote also brought these sort of emotional consequences, uh, namely that it just demanded that our team operate with an even higher level of trust in one another, in our partners, in all of the work that we were collectively doing than would have been true in a normal year. Um, we've, you know, been very fortunate to work with folks like Shalon to think about how we can use this moment to get even creator and think even bigger. I think we've ended up with a cooler product than we would have uh, uh, had in our heads early on, but, but this grounding in trust was one of my big learnings over the last couple of months. Uh, and, and as far as what we're still trying to figure out, the answer is sort of everything. Uh, the learning is just beginning. We're about to open an observation period where there will be a ton of iteration and growth for us to work for and work through in the coming years. We still have a long way to go, both to make sure that we get the word out about this at scale, but also to do additional legwork to get to the hardest to reach kids, specifically those that don't speak English. Uh, the team is really excited to drill into that, and I know that a lot of people in this room have dealt with similar issues of how to ensure broad access, uh, especially when a program is tailored for a very particular demographic. So if I could leave you all with one message, it would just be that we want to learn from you, and we are really excited to be on this journey with this collective community, uh, and we're excited to sort of see where this goes and join the constellation of folks that have been doing uh, impactful work in this space for a very long time. So with that, I will kick it over to Shalon and thank you all for your time. Really happy to be here. Hi, I'm Shalon Bridges and I'm the co-founder and CEO of a nonprofit called Hello World. We're focused on helping underrepresented youth from all around the world get opportunities like scholarships and fellowships and internships, jobs and education. I suspect most, if not all of you, share the same aspiration. I lead a tech team that's been experimenting with ways to redesign application processes so that diverse youth routinely get discovered and selected. And we've just concluded nine months of trials, so I'm going to share some of our most surprising learnings with you today. We've been exploring one central question along the way, and that is how might applications build youth up, help them to grow and develop so that even if they don't get selected for one specific opportunity, they could emerge 10 times more skilled and prepared for their next one. When we started, I had this working hypothesis that youth might want an easier application experience where the answers they gave on one application could be used for another opportunity. And 
what we quickly discovered is that while kids didn't object to that idea, they actually ranked that lowest on their priorities. Anyone want to guess what kids actually found most valuable? They wanted feedback and coaching on how to improve and develop themselves. And in retrospect, this makes total sense. The skill of learning how to articulate your potential doesn't come naturally to all of us, and it's not something most of us do on a daily basis. It's unfortunately an area where kids with affluence have an unfair advantage because they get special tutoring and help. So we really started diving in on how might we help kids without access to coaching uh, to practice and build the ability to articulate their potential. And with that in mind, we began experimenting with video so that we could invite kids to respond to application or interview questions and spot where they needed coaching. Guess where they needed the most coaching to start? They took way too long to get to the point. We had one teen from Paraguay whose first draft was 18 minutes long. We asked her to try telling her story in under three minutes, and that single change resulted in her video getting one of the highest rankings from both peers and adults. So video helped us start to identify the most common areas where coaching could have the greatest impact on helping youth to improve. And we then began another experiment. We wondered if youth could see each other's videos, might that help them to improve? And better yet, if they participated in giving feedback to each other, could the data on who they deem outstanding reveal some important clues for where decision makers might be overlooking talent? When I mention this to people, it most often invokes internal panic and uh, critique. So most often people wonder, would kids undermine each other to give themselves a competitive advantage? And we worried about this too. So we tested it and discovered that so far the opposite is actually true. Kids tend to err on the side of being generous with each other and giving high rankings is the norm. We did discover consistently low peer rankings whenever a video discussed topics that might make others uncomfortable. So topics like menstrual hygiene materials. What was really interesting is that youth turned out to be exceptionally good at spotting authentic passion in their peers and identifying those who would thrive if given an opportunity. And this has a number of really interesting implications. Involving diverse kids in the evaluation process could save evaluators time and money while also yielding a more diverse talent pool. In a few weeks, we'll be testing peer feedback on the largest scale ever, and we hope to reach a million kids from all around the world. So stay tuned for continuous updates on our findings with this. We anticipated that kids might not like so many significant changes to an application experience. I mean, we introduced video rather than written essays, public responses rather than private applications, peer review. And um, so we did a pilot in collaboration with the African Leadership Academy, and we had over a thousand kids from 50 different countries apply for a new fellowship they're offering. And at the end of that experience, we polled the kids and asked how disappointed they would be if they could no longer use Hello World. We expected really low scores. For context, uh, a benchmark to know if you've designed something people want to use is to have 40% of users say they would be super disappointed if they could no longer use your services. In our first pilot, where our app still had tons of rough edges, 90% said they'd be disappointed, and 30% said they'd be extremely disappointed. This is really remarkable. I mean, if you think about it, what's the last application you completed that you'd be sad not to do again? So while we have so much work to, left to do to improve, this really fuels us to keep going. Um, along the way, we've encountered a lot of issues. Uh, designing an application that works anywhere in the world is no small feat. It has to work on semi-smartphones in areas where Wi-Fi is spotty and data is expensive. It has to work for kids in remote and rural areas. And accomplishing that requires a sincere commitment to engineering. It doesn't just happen. 
So a huge part of our learnings were around making sure our app worked in refugee camps like Kakuma with kids stranded at home with extremely poor Wi-Fi during COVID uh, on over 200 different devices in all corners of the world. And we quickly discovered all the ways an app can fail in these situations and kept making improvements so that every kid who wanted to apply succeeded in doing so. In the process, we spun up a network of kids in remote areas to help us with ongoing user testing that's proved to be invaluable. We also learned that the questions you ask and the way you phrase them really matters when asking peers to evaluate each other. So questions we tried that didn't work were, um, for example, if you were given one wish to make life better for people, what would you wish for and why? And we hoped that peers would be able to spot empathetic people uh, uh, in the response to that question. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. Questions that did work were much more concrete and personal. So what is the problem that you're going to use your life to solve? And what are the steps you've taken to solve it already? Or in what ways do you consider yourself privileged? In what ways do you consider yourself underprivileged? Teens did a great job of uh, accurately evaluating their peers based on those questions. We're still trying to figure out a lot. Uh, there's ongoing work to identify the highest leverage ways to coach kids. And I imagine many people in the audience here have deep experience in this area, and we'd love to collaborate with you. While we started with English, our next step is to translate so that kids can communicate in whatever language they prefer. Uh, while we started with getting the flywheel of peer evaluations to yield valid signals, our next step is to do the same with adults so that hopefully if we're successful, we could eliminate implicit bias from the decision-making process. We're looking at ways that portfolios could be useful to kids, essentially building like a LinkedIn for youth and we're looking at what kinds of lessons on emerging skills that schools don't teach could be an effective tool for kids to level up. We saw this one really remarkable video from a woman in South Africa who shared a prototype she created to prevent fires from candles, which was a really common problem she witnessed in her neighborhood. She's one of only two kids that included prototypes in their video so far. And we suspect that some simple lessons on design thinking might help more kids to do this. Um, yeah, finally, we're just continuously looking at more, more evidence-based alternatives to grades and standardized tests for discovering cognitive strengths. So much work to do. As we look forward, we really want to ensure that this platform is developed for a broad range of use cases. So we're exploring more partnerships with various youth networks now. And we'd like to help a million diverse youth get opportunities within the next three years. And we really want to learn from you. So consider this an open invitation to virtual coffee together to explore ways that we could collaborate together with you. You can reach me at shalon at gethello.org. And thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much to both of our speakers, Shalon and Kathy. We're going to reconvene in real time and have a live discussion about some of the things that they've shared about RISE and Hello World. Um, and again, if you have questions for our panelists or if you have ideas about um, some of the things that uh, they've spoken about in terms of learning, um, ideas that they're potentially pursuing, if you have any um, resources you'd like to share, you can also put that in the chat box. We wanna hear from you. Um, and we will also share resources on our uh, summit website. So you can find more about information about both of our speakers and their work, um, but we're also going to be cross-posting resources that are relevant to today's discussion around skill building and connecting young people to opportunity. So Cassie and Shalon, thank you and welcome. <laughs> I know it's early where you are in Colorado and California. It's great to have you. So Thanks nice for having us. Um, I'm particularly uh, grateful for 
the many ways you've highlighted the learning process you've undergone the last nine months. This is a young program. Um, and it's really great to have you share so candidly some of the things that you've learned um, throughout the design and implementation process, including some of the assumptions you maybe had going into it and how um, you've taken the learning pieces and put that back into iterating the program. Um, so I wanted to start off with a few questions for both of you. Um, and Cassie, I'd like to start with you if I can. Um, you talked about inflection points as one of the reasons um, that the RISE program has chosen to focus on 15 to 17 year olds. Um, and I think we could say that we are at a, an inflection point as a global community right now as the impacts of the pandemic bring into stark relief both I think the weaknesses and the strengths of our systems and networks and the ways that it has accelerated many of the trends associated with the fourth industrial revolution, pushing us all to work and learn remotely and engage in digital skills and technology at scale. Um, and one of the recurring themes with the summit this year is that while technological platforms offer opportunity, we also risk a widening digital divide as more young people get left behind. And I think you touched on this when you referenced your team's decision to include paper-based application pathways and a WhatsApp option to help young people without the same level of access and privilege to get access to this opportunity. Um, and I wanted to, to dig a little bit more deeply into that decision, particularly as an, as an online application process. Um, can you say more about that and kind of how that design change came to be um, and what helped lead you to it? Sure, happy to. Um... Gosh, the like collective inflection point thing is a, it's a good point and something I think we're all feeling very much this year. Um, I mean, since very early days in this program, uh, we've recognized that especially the early years would be a steep learning curve and a process of continuous improvement. And as a result, we've leaned really heavily on our networks of uh, partners to make sure that we weren't trying to reinvent things that shouldn't be reinvented but also to make sure that, uh, especially once it became impossible for us to travel and sort of see what situations looked like on the ground, to make sure that we were operating in a, operating in a way that was sensitive and, and sort of grounded in local realities. And as we went through the process of developing what RISE would look like and what the pathways into RISE would look like, um, we tried to be as open as possible to feedback about what the barriers could be for young people that could keep them out of the program. Uh, and some of those barriers that were called out very early were uh, sort of technological, like if you can't count on a kid having a phone, and additionally this year you can't count on them going to a central institution like a school where someone might have a phone, what then could you possibly do that would give them a pathway into the program? Mm -hmm. uh, some of the sort of barriers to access that we found were also less technological um, and more uh, grounded in what a student's particular reality could be. So for example, you know, how do you convince parents and families and teachers and the communities that surround young people that this is a, a valid and safe and useful pathway? Uh, and so we've had to put a lot of thought into that. You know, on, on both of those questions, we've been pretty heavily led by partners. And I think the thing that we recognize is that uh, in year one, we're not gonna get it totally right, unfortunately. Uh, we're going to do the absolute best we can to create a pathway into this program for as many young people around the world as possible. Shalon's work has been, I think, has allowed for a far broader set of young people to access it through Hello World than we would have initially envisioned, which is fantastic. In subsequent years, I think we'll be able to go even farther, especially as, as we build out additional language capabilities. Um, but the truth is that I'm confident that in year one, we are going to have some... Uh, something happened, some things happen that make us say next year we need to push harder on this and our team's really excited about those opportunities. Um, so yeah, just led by partners and led by trying to improve as much as possible in the in the coming years. Thank you. Yeah, I mean you touched on technological barriers, but also kind of broader systemic and cultural barriers to these opportunities and we had a question come through the chat box that I think is is relevant to this. Um, around the kind of code of applications, the language and norms expected of applicants for these kinds of prestigious opportunities and what we signal in the language we use and the platforms we use to young people about, is this for them? Um, and I do, I, you know, I think that's a really great point. Um, and I'd actually love to come back to it uh, as we talk a bit more about the kind of the mechanics of um, the platform with Shalon as well. But it also, you know, I wanna sort of ask you, um, 
you're, you're really describing building a system of opportunity for youth with kind of wraparound services. And I think what's been interesting to us about this program is it's rethinking the application pathway from a kind of one-off action a young person could take to apply for something to even if they're not selected, that there is a learning process uh, and systems of support built into that pathway all along. Um, and I think that's pretty interesting. And it sounds like you're learning a huge amount as you've tried to get this off the ground and make it accessible to as many young people. Um, but taking a step back, I wanted to invite you to, to talk a bit more about how your team situates a program like RISE within the bigger landscape of youth economic opportunity and, and talent investment. Um, because I know you all spent a lot of time engaging conversation with partners like us and other organizations working in the youth development space to sort of map the landscape. So what are some of the specific gaps that you identified that you hope to fill um, and the kinds of investments, I think, alongside that, that your team would want to see from other funders, other partners within the system to kind of complement and buttress what it is that you're doing through the RISE program? Sure. Um, yeah, so there are, there are a couple of things about RISE um, that we hope will be contributions to a space that's already full of people doing awesome work. And, um, and I think we were very conscious coming in that like, there are a lot of people doing really awesome work in this space. And if we tried to reinvent someone else's work, we, we were likely to end up with a, a worse product. Um, so the, the things that we wanted to do with Rise that at, at least uh, that we hope will make it a, a unique and appealing opportunity to young people around the world is we really cared about this idea of uh, a lifetime commitment to these people <clears throat> and to being open to working with them in ways that are personalized and tailored to their needs as they move through these different moments in their lives and these different stages of thinking about how they can use their time and their talents and their energy to serve other people. Um, and that idea of how do, you, how do you construct something that is, you know, and this is a little bit unusual for us, but that's not designed for just one inflection point, but that's instead fluid enough to help uh, people migrate between different inflection points, even if they're coming from very different places. That was a design challenge we were really excited about from day one. Um, another thing that we were excited about was this idea of creating incentives and uh, structures and opportunities for people to spend more of their life thinking about serving other people. Um, the, I think the key insight that we had with both our associate product manager program, which I described in the video, but also with our science fellows program, which was like the first thing that we ever launched as an organization, is that oftentimes people wanna do the stuff that you wanna see them do. Like they, they wanna be multidisciplinary scientists, they wanna pursue service, but uh, especially if they come from disadvantaged backgrounds, there's no one helping them take on the risk of doing that type of thing, as opposed to taking on a far more secure pathway that would lead them into a lucrative private sector career. And we were excited about how we could think about being that risk capital for, for young people that were figuring out how they could use their lives to do more stuff for other people. Um, so that sense of, of lifetime commitment, that sense of um, service as a key sort of mutual commitment inside of the program, uh, we hope will be new and unusual. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've been flavored and influenced and redirected by partners along the way. Sarah, you and your team are an excellent example of that. Shalon is like one of the thought partners that has transformed Rise uh, since very early days. And so, you know, where we, where we started and where we've gone, I think reflects pulling in a much broader constellation of, of partners in the ecosystem than we had certainly when we announced last November. I really love the expression risk serving as like the risk capital for youth. Um, you know, that's, a, that's something I've thought a lot about as I've seen the emergence of more and more youth entrepreneurship programs, accelerators, incubators, kind of pushing youth into being in the entrepreneurial space out of necessity as much as, you know, demand. Um, but that there's often these big gaps in, in support around asking young people to take the risk of starting a business or um, taking a leap into something unfamiliar. Um, and I think the impact of the pandemic and how quickly people fell through the cracks, you know, is I think indicative of that this is a huge area of need for young people. So it's an interesting kind of turn of phrase that I think is something we can, we can think about. Um, and certainly, you know, we're, it's been great to work with your team. Um, the summit represents this big community of international development, you know, organizations that have been working around these issues and have 
other youth networks. So, you know, it'd be great if there's folks on the, um, on the call this morning who have specific examples of programs that um, potentially adapt design-centered thinking. I know Monics and Save the Children is doing some of this work. Um, or if you have recommendations for youth networks for the team to consider, we'd love to hear from you and you can add that in the chat box as well as your questions. Um, last question for you, Cassie, for now. I, I, I really appreciated what you shared about how the switch to remote has had effects on your team. We talk a lot about the impacts on young people, but we're also organizations ourselves working to serve and work with young people. And we're all experiencing the impacts of the pandemic in real time. Um, and I, in particular, the kind of issue of the socio-emotional consequences of this shift um, and how all of us have had to operate at a higher level of trust with each other and our partners. I think that really resonated. I think it's certainly something that we as a, as a company have also experienced. Um, and then I think is really relevant for how we work with young people, this idea of carrying trust into that partnership, into that relationship. Um, these are really highly relatable themes. I appreciate you bringing up uh, some of the impacts that you know, your, your team has felt as, the, as an implementing organization. Um, and you also talked about entering a period of, of iteration and growth. And so I'm interested to, to hear more about how you see this particular experience that your team has had translating into the work of the RISE program longer term and how it might inform the design and how you work with different partners. Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think the hope is that trust born of necessity doesn't expire when the necessity changes. Um, so over the last few months, we've had to trust each other because like, you know, our data scientist who is driving forward on rise, I can't see him all day. I can't see what he's working on. I can't see exactly what he's doing. Um, it's impossible to have too tight of a grip on the reins when, when you're leading these teams. And it's, um, it, it, it requires some element of just like letting people do their thing and believing that if you share a goal, you're probably going to get to a mutually agreeable place and a, in many cases, a place that's better than you might have initially thought that it was going to be. Um, I, think, I think my big hope coming out of the pandemic is that um, even once that space is no longer required for safety reasons, that we can keep that same default assumption that the people around us are doing the right thing. And that if we share a goal, uh, folks are trying to sort of sprint towards it in, in whichever ways they can and, and with whichever uh, tools they have at their disposal. Um, I mean, that said, like, there are, there are things that I think would have been so much easier if we'd been able to just hash them out in person over the last six months. Um, we ha recently had a split on our team over, uh, like, one relatively minor design question on Rise, where we realized that people were just, like, not speaking the same language about it. And it was one of those moments when if everyone had been in the same room, you would have been, there wouldn't have been any need for translation. There wouldn't have been any need to like schedule a meeting and navigate time zones and all of that stuff. And so I think my hope is that we can, once we get those opportunities to like hear each other very clearly, we don't lose the amount of faith that we've all had to put into each other over the last few months. Because I think it's been, well, it's been a challenging time. I think in a lot of cases, it's been sometimes empowering for people. Um, and I think that message connects pretty nicely to the, the young people that we're looking for. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to give people an opportunity to show us the, their best thing that they wanna show us about themselves, to like give them a pathway to show us what they wanna spotlight. And I think we are probably like necessarily less prescriptive in telling them exactly what that has to look like right now. So there's one phase of our application where we'll ask them to work on a project and not really dictate what the terms of that project are. And thinking about it now, I think, and I'd love to hear Shalon agrees, uh, I think maybe some of the philosophy of that is born of this time where we've had to be like, I don't know what you're gonna come up with, but I think it might be really cool, so I wanna give you the space to come up with it. So I hope we can preserve those ingredients, but that we can also all eat lunch together again soon. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. But I also think, you know, carrying, kind of walking the walk and applying the trust we've had to have in each other as colleagues inside our organizations to the way that we work with and engage with young people as partners in these programs. And that you, 
you want to create structure and pathways, but you also want to provide enough space within that for young people to be creative and have the room to try things and to fail and to start again, um, you know, and, and to come with their own ideas. Um, and I think, you know, as we, we support um, the YP2LE Youth Lead Network, it's about 10,000 young change makers from around the world. And some of the creativity and innovation we've seen um, you know, over the last four years, but in particularly the last, you know, gosh, eight months now of this pandemic as they've adapted is really tremendous. And so the questions I think are, you know, how do you capture that kind of energy and innovation and, and you know, make sure that you take advantage of this moment and support young people. So applying some of the, the real time lessons we've all learned um, as professionals and, and taking that into our work with youth, I think is a, is a big theme. And I appreciate you being really honest about what that's looked like for your team. Um, I think and we could all benefit from problem. that. <laughs> um, so Shalon, I, I want to turn to you um, and get into some of the more kind of nitty gritty mechanics of this platform mm -hmm. that you've developed with Hello World um, and kind of revisit this idea of building in skilling and opportunity and learning kind of all along the way. Because um, I do think it really is a different way of thinking about assessment and skill building and talent identification that doesn't just have, I think, implications for young people pursuing an opportunity through the RISE program, but that could potentially be applied to employers and how they think about recruiting. It could be applied to young people who may not see opportunities as being for them, kind of going back to this really good question around you know, coding and signaling of opportunities. Um, but before I kind of go into the, the platform itself, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about who these youth are that you're currently working with and understanding the network. So what is the profile of a typical applicant who's been engaged on the platform so far? And how did you identify these young people? What did that process look like? Yeah, great. Okay, so um, the profile so far has been 15 to 17 year olds. And uh, we've had kids from over 50 countries participate. And I, I love the question about, you know, how do kids see themselves and, and see this as a place that they could belong or an opportunity they could even consider applying to. And that's where, uh, in some ways, the video format has, um, has, has done that, even though we didn't anticipate that originally. Because when kids can view each other's videos and see someone from you know, Zimbabwe and someone from Nepal and uh, someone else from Colombia and see these responses, um, they not only see somebody you know, within proximity to them on their own continent, but they see youth around the world engaged in questions and issues that are of interest to them. And that turns out to be a magic window in for them to try things. Uh, so yeah, we, um, that's really important to us, making sure that kids um, can see themselves in this. And we're super proud that if you, if you look through the app today, it's 100% diverse from day one. Um, and that, that kids uh, feel welcomed and that we create a positive uh, community for them where, where kindness is the rule <laughs> and support. So, um, so that's one piece. And then just in terms of helping them to level up that's all been about partnerships. Um, so, you know, sort of echoing what Cassie has said, um, there's so much good work around the world, whether it's, you know, we worked with the African Leadership Academy, they've done amazing work. Uh, we're working with Ivy House that has also worked with kids uh, in Europe, with Bekelos in Mexico, with, um, uh, Global Citizen Year, all sorts of programs that are doing really great work with a subset of kids, but could have a larger ripple effect and a larger impact if they could just reach more kids. Um, and so that's where we kind of hope we can help, uh, not duplicate awesome work that's already being done, but to amplify and help expand the impact that everybody's already doing. So yeah. yeah, building networks on networks and tapping into exactly. 
deep. Yeah, I mean, we think about this a lot with through youth lead is this idea of, you know, there's the youth lead network, but it, within it, it represents a kind of myriad of other groups of young people with their own peer groups. Um, and the idea is to kind of create almost like a ladder down to the ground um, and back up again. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's interesting to, to know. Um, but I, I wanted to kind of understand from you, you know, you've talked, you've shared a lot of really great insights into um, the design process, how iterative it has been, all the things you've learned along the way. Um, I wondered if you could kind of take a step back and help our audience understand if you're a young person coming to the Hello World application process, what does it look like from the time you, I don't know, log in <laughs> to the time you finish the application? Because what you've described is, is you know, an application portal, but it is also this kind of period of uh, a pathway of skilling and support. And so I'm interested in kind of what the experience is like for a young person going through it and how your team decided at what points does a young person need additional wraparound services? Um, where is the opportunity to bring in an adult coach or mentor? Um, and how are those decisions kind of made along the way? Yeah. So um, let's start with just what the experience is like for kids. Uh, they download the app um, either on Android or iOS and they go in and most of them start by just looking at what's already been done. So they'll go into an area that we call challenges and um, it's sort of the practice zone where they can just see a variety of questions that you might get asked on an application or in an interview process and start to try responding to those. So they would respond on video. They can retake it if they don't like their first shot and then share it with the community at large and then get practice giving feedback to each other on um, just really simple ways that you might evaluate uh, the quality of a video. And so that process of trying, then seeing how you might uh, think about, they get served three other peers videos from around the world that have answered the exact same question. And then they can go back and revise their own if they want. Like they, what we see is that they learn in that process and then they reflect and they'll go back and work on their video. Um, when they feel ready, they'll go in to an opportunity so, uh, and apply to be a RISE Fellow. And there we've just really tried to design an application process that um, you know, can be accomplished within, uh, really if you wanted to do it from start to finish within under an hour and where there's no um, tutoring required to succeed on it. It's just your real self. And we've tried to really give kids multiple shots on goal and multiple ways to describe their interests, their talents. And, um, and that's the entire process. They get a place to practice, a place to apply, and then they get to see multiple opportunities. So, um, you know, they can, can apply to RISE and then turn around and apply to another program that's interested in offering coaching to kids, another one that does um, uh, a scholarship. Um, so those Great. are the basic mechanics. It sounds like there's a lot of, I mean, a key element of this is, is expectation setting. And we talk about this quite a bit when we think about creating opportunities for youth in our own network is that um, what are we, what is it that we're offering and being really clear about that? And what are we not promising as well? Mm. And then what are the expectations of a young person engaging in the program and what can they expect of us? And mm. being really clear about those messages up front. And I think sometimes we, as like adult implementers, you talked about sort of um, having assumptions around framing a question and what would work and how that didn't quite stick. I think yeah. that that's a challenge for us sometimes in terms of how we clearly set expectations of what it is we are offering and what, what it is we're not and being really, uh, I think, treating young people respectfully by communicating that up front. How, how did you think about that when you talked, you know, as you communicate to young people, like, you know, this platform's great and you'll have all these chances and opportunities and, you know, it'll open up doors. Like, how do you kind of balance that with 
really clearly laying out for young people, like what is it, what is their responsibility and what is yours as they enter into this program? Yeah. Um, and that's a particular challenge, right, when you're trying to communicate clearly to kids all around the world who speak all different languages um, and have all different backgrounds. So really, we had to do a couple of things. One is just like aim to be as intuitive and as visual as possible so that you could, you know, your grandmother could understand how to navigate things. Um, so that it was just successful without instruction. Um, but then when we did need to give instruction and guidance, that's where we did a lot of testing, uh, you know, with various partners and with youth to, um, to just check, you know, what did work, what was clear, where might they misinterpret something that we hadn't even anticipated and then revised it. And yeah, so, and that's a constant process. That's, you know, um yeah well this is what related um because you shared a lot of really interesting insights into the learning takeaways of the past nine months um yeah. and you talked about ongoing work to identify um the ways to best leverage coaching for kids you talked about the issue of language barriers and translation you mentioned this idea of um portfolios can we create a linkedin for young people um Creating kind of like economic, economic and professional identity online. Um, you talked about lessons on emerging skills that schools are not teaching that can help youth level up, um, design thinking, continue looking for evidence. But the thing that jumped out at me was adult signals um, and implicit bias. Um, we, we put a lot of focus on young people and their skills and what we expect of them. But at the end of the day, on the other side of these projects are often adults with our own kind of ideas and attitudes about young people, even if we prescribe to PYD frameworks or positive youth development frameworks and we imagine, you know, we support young people, we still struggle with the bias, I think, of when, you know, you see an application in against another range of applications. And um, how is your team thinking about that? And, you know, if that was a, a learning takeaway and you're looking forward to rolling out the program and working with adult partners, how are you thinking about this issue of implicit bias? and among adults on the side of this equation. Yeah, um, and Cassie's team has done amazing work on this. So Cassie, I hope you'll jump in as well. But really, you know, I think in part, it starts with just deeply analyzing our whole process of, um, of how we evaluate kids. And so for us, providing a data point on what diverse peers thought was outstanding and excellent is something that just most evaluators haven't had in hand ever before. Mm -hmm. So that's something to compare against adults. But then we've been doing all of these tests where we see what are the gaps? Where are the places where kids rank something high and adults rank it low or vice versa? And what are the patterns to that? Um, and, and where are we spotting biases, whether they're in, in peers or adults? And so just really systematically looking at that data by taking, you know, this structured feedback that peers give to each other, applying the same structured feedback to an interview process, and then being able to compare the two um, just opens up a lot of analysis that you don't have when you're just you know, conducting an interview, hoping you, it's unbiased, but there's no analysis going on and, and, um, and data work behind the scenes. Cassie, is there anything you would add to that? I, I think that was great. Um, yeah, just picking apart every different piece of information that we're collecting and seeing what we can do to make it as fair and equitable as possible has been the goal. Um, we've, we've been, doing some sort of initial research about how well this works with um, with hundreds of kids around the world so far. And we've already learned a lot. And I'm confident that, especially once we open up more broadly, we're going to have an even richer set of data where we'll find new places where we can correct and modify and sort of adjust for all of these potential biases. Um, but we've tried to be just methodical about like combing out every knot as we find it. Yeah, yeah. And there was a question around um, 
where and how you might share some of these results or some of these findings with the community. Is that is there somewhere, is there a plan for a research paper or some kind of um, resource that we can we can put out to this broader network of uh, GYEO? I hope so. Figuring out what that might look like is in the works. Okay. <laughs> Um, so last question, I think, for, for Shalon, um, before we, we transition to um, our breakout sessions, and just for attendees on the line, I have put a link to our breakout sessions in the chat box on the bottom right. Um, you can choose from one of four breakout sessions um, hosted by our partners on different topics relevant to this discussion around skills for young people. Um, so do check there for instructions, and then let us know if you have any issues. Um, Shalon, I wanted to come back to a question I had posed to Cassie at the beginning, which is kind of how you situate this program within the bigger landscape of programs that are trying to help young people, you know, skill up and access opportunities. Um, and I know you've both been involved in Pearson in the past. You've both worked in this space for a while. Just interested to hear, you know, nine months into this program now, where do you see it kind of fitting and adding to where the gaps are? Yeah. Um, so I think there's a few key ways. One is just can we amplify great work uh, for local on the ground programs working with kids and help them reach more. Um, so that's one area. The other is just, um, you know, so many youth organizations that I've talked to and worked with do not have engineering teams or legal teams to help them to scale, to design an app that could reach kids, you know, in any corner of the world. And we're just hoping that by taking some of that back end work off of, um, off of their plate that, that they might not have even been able to afford or consider or do, that uh, we can free them to do their great work with kids. Great. Well, we are just about at time. Um, before we wrap, I wanted just to offer both of you a chance to share any kind of final comments or thoughts before we close out today's discussion. Cassie, do you have any last kind of words that you'd want to share or any ask of this community um, who's been listening so attentively <laughs> to some of the findings from your work? Uh, just a huge thanks to you and the team and to everyone that joined this morning uh, slash afternoon slash evening, de depending on where <laughs> in the world you are. Um, and, you know, we're, we're very serious when we say that we want to learn from you. And so uh, really looking forward to getting to tap into the collective know-how of this group and um, grateful for the opportunity to share. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I would just echo that uh, the expertise at the summit and the deep commitment to youth is, um, you know, just something that we're so excited to uh, participate in and, and collaborate with you. And um, we are so grateful for this chance. Well, thank you to you both. Um, I don't know if folks are aware, but um for both Cassie and Shalon, this meant a very early morning <laughs> wake up where you are. I think it was maybe 5.30 your time, Shalon. So thank you so much for sharing uh, some of the learning that you've been ex you've experienced the last nine months. It's, um, it's really great to see organizations like yours being um, as transparent and honest and open about kind of learning and adaptation. Um, and, you know, I think, as I said, we're gonna be sharing resources from this discussion online. This recording will be available on the GYEO Summit site. Um, and if you do want to learn more about RISE and Hello World, um, you can connect with our team and we can put you in touch. Um, we'll also have information for both organizations on the website so you can learn more. Um, and our community has a lot of expertise and a lot of information to provide. So I know all of you out there have great programs that you can connect to RISE as well. Um, so thank you again to our speakers and to everybody for joining us this morning. Um, we are going to now transition to our 60 minute breakout sessions and um, we hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you again to everybody for joining.